Hello, everybody. Welcome to Smithsonian Science How, where today we are going to be exploring what Mars reveals about life in our universe. We are super excited about this program because it is bringing together scientists from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History and scientists from the Air and Space Museum. And uh, we have a lot of news about Mars lately with the Perseverance landing. And so we are really excited to dive in and share um, some science about Mars. Now we started the program just a minute or two early so that we can cover some basic um, details about today's program so that you can make the most of it. First, we want to say hello to all of our friends who are joining us. Today, our program, um, we have about we have people from about 14 different countries and 160 different schools from 36 states in the District of Columbia signed up. And we want to extend a very warm welcome and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. We are so happy to join your virtual classrooms. Um, and here you see just a collection of some of the schools that are joining us. We have Cumberland Valley, Taper Avenue Elementary, Winthrop School. Um, special shout out, hello, thank you so much for joining us. Now, um, we also have a Q&A space where I wanna say hello to a couple of people who are joining us here. Um, welcome, Nit Hill, Ethan, Peyton, Jaden, Joseph, Grayson, Madeline, Steve, Leon, Declan, Viham. We are so happy to have you here today to learn about Mars along with us. Now, to make the most out of today's program, I wanna cover a couple basic um, details about this webinar. This program is a Zoom webinar, which means that while you can see and hear me, you cannot turn on your video or your audio. You can interact with us through our Q&A space, which many of you are finding right now, and through polls. The Q&A button is located either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of the screen in the Zoom menu. And you can type your questions and comments to us there. We will be responding to those directly. A team of educators will be sending responses and a team of scientists who I'll introduce in a moment will also be responding there. So during the program, if you've asked a question, make sure to check your My Questions tab to be right next to the Open Questions tab to see if somebody has responded to you. We have a lot of friends in today's program, so try to just send your question once because that'll allow us to get through more questions. And you will not be able to see the questions of your friends or anybody else. You'll only be able to see the questions that our experts have answered today. Now we have a series of polls, which um, you will be able to vote on and they should pop right up on your screen when we launch them. Also today's program is closed captioned. You can find the CC button in that same Zoom menu, either on the bottom or the top of the screen, and click Show Subtitles to be able to see um, those closed captions. They may not be perfectly accurate because of the technology, but they should be pretty close. All right. Um, so it's about one o'clock now, and I want to um, let everybody know about the special guests that we have today. Um, we, like I mentioned, we have a team of educators who are working behind the scenes to make this program run smoothly, so thank you. But we also have an awesome team of chat expert scientists from both the Natural History Museum and the Air and Space Museum who are here to answer your questions in the chat. So I wanna invite them all to turn their cameras on so they can introduce themselves briefly. All right, welcome everyone. So here we have some of our experts who will be some of the scientists who are responding in that Q&A space. And I wanna give each one of them a moment to introduce themselves. And so let's um, start here with uh, Erica. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Erica Jowen. I'm a planetary scientist at the uh, Natural History Museum. And I study Mars. I look at glaciers and how the climate of Mars has changed over time. I also study volcanoes on the moon. And I'm currently working on NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission, which is investigating asteroid Bennu. So I'll be happy to answer all your questions that you put in the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you, Erica. Hey, Emma. 
Hi everybody, my name is Emma and I'm a geologist and my speciality is in looking at meteorites, in particular looking at what water has done on asteroids. And I am super excited to be here today answering all your questions. So pop those questions in the chat window. We're here for you. Wonderful, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sharon Purdy. I'm a geologist at the National Air and Space Museum. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at the surface of Mars using different images from orbiters and rovers. So I'm excited to be here today and looking forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Sharon. Hi, Tim. Hey, everyone. Good to be here with you today. I'm Tim. I study meteorites at the Natural History Museum, and I've been lucky enough to work on six different spacecraft missions that have explored the inner solar system all the way from Mercury to the asteroid belt. And I'm mostly interested in how did planets melt to form a layered world like our Earth. Looking forward to chatting with you all today. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Hey, Alex. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex. I'm, at the, I'm a geologist at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, I mostly use orbital data, so images from satellites, to try to understand what Mars was like in its early history, so how much water there was flowing through its valleys and forming its deltas and lakes. And I'm excited to answer your questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. And thank you for showing us this <laughs> virtual background. <laughs> all right. So those are some of the scientists. You can, um, as you heard, they all have a little bit of a different perspective on studying geology in space and Mars. And they will be able to answer some extra questions because we will not be able to answer every single one of them live today on video. Um, now, I also want to invite on um, Shauna, who is uh, another um, educator here who is going to be facilitating today's program with me. All right. Hello. I'm going to pause just a minute um, so that we can um, properly introduce ourselves now that we have most of our friends here. So hello, my name is Maggie Benson. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am an, a museum educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. All right, and I am Shauna Edson. I am an astronomy educator at the National Air and Space Museum, and I am also really excited to be here today. Yes, so Shauna and I will be your educators today for a virtual field trip to Mars, and we are going to invite three of our scientists um, on camera in just a moment to learn about how they study Mars and the potential for life on Mars. Um, those scientists, I have a slide here to show you who those scientists are. Um, we will meet uh, Dr. Carrie Corrigan, Dr. Mache Aaron, and Mariah Baker. And we are going to take your questions after we meet each one of these scientists and also at the end of our program. And we've shared here these adorable pictures of them as young children because sometimes space science can seem really intimidating and hard. But the scientists that study geology and space and Mars and work on these spacecraft missions were kids once too, just like you. So they followed their curiosities and we're gonna learn about how it has prepared them for the careers that they have today. Now, um, and here they are now. So um, we will meet them in just a moment. But before we do, we wanna launch our first poll. We want to see how many people in our audience would like to go to Mars. So you can um, practice using those polls. And um, we have a lot of people who said are saying. Wow. I was going to say there's a, a, a split of opinion, but it's there's some strong leanings here. This is great. Got some aspiring astronauts. This is great. Now, when, while people continue to vote, um, Shauna, you are a Mars fan and an educator at the Air and Space Museum. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so um, at the Air and Space Museum, we have a public observatory and a whole astronomy program where we talk about the solar system, the planets, the stars, the things we can see. And we talk a lot about Mars. And I've been especially excited about that, given that Perseverance just landed and we're getting all this new information about Mars. And a lot of people who visit the museum will ask me, well, is there life on Mars? Like, what do we know about that? And that's a huge question. 
whether there is or has been life on Mars. And it's a big enough question that a lot of different areas of science are all working on it. We're working on it in different ways. Uh, so at the Air and Space Museum, we have people who research Mars planetary geology, like Alex and Sharon, who are answering questions uh, as experts today. And so we're using that information to help lead toward someday being able to send people to Mars, but we need to understand it before we go there. So learning all of that, just, I love it. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. And Shauna, um, I am going to end this poll in three, two, one, and share with you and all of our visitors that most of you would go to Mars. How awesome. <laughs> hey. now, now we're not going to physically go to Mars today, and neither have our scientists. We're going to learn about the different ways in which our scientists study Mars without going there. Isn't that right? Exactly. Yeah, because there's all these different ways that we can get at the information, and we need different people to study the, the planet and everything about it in different ways to sort of solve the mysteries and help us figure out how we're going to get there. Um, and I believe that leads us to our next question poll. Uh, which is um, of all the different ways that one could study Mars, if you were going to study Mars, what would you want to study? The rocks, the air, the landforms, which is things like mountains and rivers and valleys, um, or the minerals that make up all those things? I'm already seeing a bunch of answers. This is great. This is excellent. We have everybody is participating here and we see a lot of um, results coming in for the minerals that make up yeah. all those things. We have, cool. all right, we're going to give everyone just a couple more seconds to vote before we share. And while you're finishing up your votes, let's go ahead and invite some of our scientists to turn on their cameras so that they can hear these results as well. Yes. All right, there we have Carrie, we have Mariah, and we have Mache. Excellent. Okay, so we are going to close this poll in three, two, one. Time's up. All right. <laughs> wow, we got a lot of mineral fans. That's awesome. And you know, we've, we've invited our experts here today because they study these different things. So you're going to get to learn about how each of these um, areas of study contributes to our understanding of Mars. This is so cool. Absolutely. So while we hear from our scientists, just keep those things in mind. They're studying the, they're studying all of those things, the rocks, the air, the landforms, and the minerals. So we're going to learn about all of these different ways you can study Mars without physically, well, personally going there. <laughs> we do have a very special um, uh, lander that's there now. Exactly. We've sent robots thus far to do some work for us. Um, and that's given us a lot of what, what we study, but we're, we're always wanting to learn more. Okay. We're going to go ahead and have each one of our scientists introduce themselves. So let's start with you, Carrie. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. So my name is Carrie Corrigan, and I am a geologist at the Natural History Museum in the Smithsonian. And as you can see from this, these pictures of me when I was little, I've always liked rocks and I've always liked being outside, but I never really knew that you could have a job where you worked with rocks or took care of rocks or studied rocks. But that's me on the right with Tim, who you met a little bit earlier. And together we curate the meteorite collection at the, at the Natural History Museum. And and those are rocks. So what particularly do I look at in rocks? I really, I like rocks because they're kind of a story, right? Each rock is its own story and it has its own story to tell about how it formed. And the minerals inside those rocks are the clues that, that, that give us information about how those rocks formed. Like every rock is like a puzzle and the minerals inside of those rocks are the pieces of the puzzle, the clues that help us figure out how they formed. And some of those minerals that were formed in the rocks were the very first things that formed in the rock, like a lava flow, if you can go to the next slide. Some of those were the very first things that formed when that rock first formed. And some of these rocks might be hundreds of thousands or millions of years old. So those might be the first minerals to form. Either maybe it was a lava flow or a magma chamber that solidified underground. Or some of these minerals may have formed later in the rock's history. Like both of these rocks that you can see here, the one on the left, it got in contact with some water. And so the 
the minerals inside of this rock actually oxidize or rusted. And same with the rock on the right, it actually, its original minerals were broken apart by probably something hitting it. And then water came in contact with this one and you can see some rust on there as well. So I've always liked rocks and I, and I have, I mean, maybe some of you also have rock collections. Rock collections are part of what got mineral collections that kind of got me into it. But looking at these rocks now that I've just talked to you a little bit about these stories and clues, have a look at these again and see that you can see some things have happened to these and that's part of their story. Some of them are broken up and have contained pieces of other rocks. Some of them are just lots of minerals put together, but some of them like the one in the middle, that rock formed as a bunch of layers and then it was, then it was smushed and so it all wrinkled up. So for me, each time something new happens to these rocks, the environment around it changed. It was original environment and then maybe some water came in and changed the environment or it got heated up and changed the environment or it got swished by plate tectonics. So that we look at the minerals and we can unravel this story like detectives and figure out what happened to these rocks. So for me, I geologist, the geo and geologist actually means earth, but it turns out that I actually study meteorites that are not from earth. So what is a meteorite? It's a rock that has come to earth from space and you can, maybe you've seen a shooting star. A meteorite is just a shooting star that didn't burn all the way up and the rock landed on the earth. And this meteorites from space can help us look at, at and all solving the puzzle of the solar system. So the minerals that are in the meteorites that we study are actually clues to how our solar system formed. And if you look at the next slide, I think we have, these are some pictures of meteorites that have come to earth from space. And, and since this program is about Mars, we're gonna to talk today about some meteorites that have come from Mars because indeed some of them do. And um, we're gonna talk about the minerals in those that can help us understand the environment on Mars that may or may not be conducive to life. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Carrie. And we do want to um, launch one poll, see um, just a final check for um, kind of thinking about meteorites. So you study meteorites and you study the clues inside of them. But um, we want to ask our viewers if they can think about meteorites and where in space they may come from. Um, and while you're voting on that, um, we are going to transition over to meeting our next scientist. Yes, indeed. And I saw that um, we even had a question come in uh, from uh, Nijia O, oh, who asked, how do you study Mars when you didn't even go there? And that segues perfectly into my friend Mache and what she studies. So Mache, can you tell us a little about how you study Mars without going there? <laughs> Absolutely. So my name is Mache Aaron. I'm a, I'm a third year planetary science PhD student at Johns Hopkins. I study minerals on Mars using light that is measured by satellites. So growing up, my grandparents always wanted me to be a lot of things. Um, but the thing that stuck well with me was studying planets. Um, and this is because my grandparents took me to space camp at Space Center Houston every summer until I aged out at 13. But every summer we had so much fun and it, I just thoroughly enjoyed studying planets and I knew this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So the next, uh, next slide. So, hmm. So I have a question for everyone. I don't know if we're still doing polls, but- um, um, Yes, indeed. We are? Okay, cool. Yep. So I guess for this poll, I wanna ask everyone, is this the real color of Mars? Give everyone a second. Can, yeah, and you all can think about when you've seen Mars or pictures you've seen, or maybe if you've seen it in the sky. But yeah, she was talking about light and color. So we wanna get you thinking about that. But I'm seeing an even split. I'm seeing a few, a little more than a third saying no, about a little under a third saying yes, and about one third saying they're not sure. So okay. we're going to run that poll until three, two, one, go. Okay, then. It definitely isn't even split. I love this because it actually is yes and no. So the picture that we're looking at here is of Mars, of course. But um, what scientists tend to do is take images from Mars and try to enhance colors that we can't normally see with our eyes because they're very subtle. And the reason why we enhance these colors is because we want to show these different um, 
color differences that are related to the minerals that are on the surface of Mars. And I'm going to talk about that um, later in my segment. Um, but like I said previously, I use light to study, I use light from the sun and satellites, and I study and I look for in the sorry, <laughs> I use light from the sun um, to study the rocks to identify the rocks that are on the surface of Mars and satellites um, pick up that reflection from the sunlight and create this graph that we see called a spectrograph. And with that spectrograph, I'm able to determine what type of rocks I'm looking at based on the absorptions, which is gonna be the word that you might hear again during my segment. Now I'm seeing that there's a big arrow from the sun. So there's like a lot coming from the sun and then there's a little arrow going to your satellite. So some of the light is come from the sun is hitting, well, it's hitting the planet. Some of it's coming back to the satellite and that chart is what the satellite sees. Is that, is that right? Exactly. So all the sun's energy, it was all the sun's light is going towards the planet. And then when the rocks feel that light, they're going to feel energized and will start dancing. And, but somehow some of the, some of the light is not going to be absorbed by the rocks. So the rest is going to be reflected off. And that's what the satellite picks up. And these little absorptions are how we're able to determine what the rocks are based on the amount of uh, light that they absorb. Very cool. And you've even got pictures of the rocks that they are. Exactly. <laughs> and of course, I can take that information from those minerals and I can make a color coded map to see where these minerals are located in my image. And this is actually really helpful for scientists because this is how we're able to see if these minerals that are really that are conducive to life or really good for life um, are in an area that used to have water on Mars. Very cool. So in this, so you're using colors on that map to show you where those different minerals are at? Yes, ex exactly. So we're using those colors of red, green, and blue to um, highlight those different, um, different minerals that are there. And sometimes those colors are going to mix too, which is good because that can tell us that this mineral has more than one uh, property to it that's really important for us to study. Super cool. Um, but, um, but ultimately, making these maps are really important for us because this is how we're able to determine what happened in the Mar to Mars in the past, as well as if it's even possible for us to be there in the future. So yeah, so you've got two pictures here. So is that like one is before and one is after? Um, in my heart, I wish I could say this is before on the left and then <laughs> after on the right. But um, ultimately, the one on the right is what we believe Mars looked like before when it used to have a lot of water. Okay, yeah, that, that one looks more like Earth and a little more friendly. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Well, this is awesome. So, so you have, you use light and information from satellites above Mars to look at those minerals and map them and figure out what it used to be like. Uh, that is an excellent uh, contrast to our next scientist we're going to meet, uh, who uses information from robots that go all the way down to the surface to study more about the Mars environment. Uh, so, Mariah, would you like to come on and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mariah Baker. I'm a planetary scientist at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Um, I grew up in um, Boston, Massachusetts, and, um, and when I was younger, I was always uh, interested in, in space, um, but I was uh, also interested in a lot of other things. Um, I was uh, dreamt of, of being an archaeologist and studying the pyramids in Egypt, uh, or being a professional soccer player, or um, even a, a Broadway actress. Um, so I had lots of different dreams, um, but I don't do any of that now. Um, what I do um, currently is I uh, study Mars and uh, specifically I work on, on uh, Mars surface missions. So there are three missions that I'm uh, currently a part of. I'm uh, a member on the Curiosity rover mission team, the InSight lander team, and the newest addition, the, the Perseverance rover mission team, which hopefully some of you watched the, the exciting landing a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Mars is getting a little bit uh, crowded these days, but it's a, a really exciting time. Um, and working on surface missions is, is super unique. Uh, you're working with 
lots of different scientists and engineers really across the world uh, on a daily basis. And uh, for those of us who are on the Perseverance mission right now, uh, we are actually working on something that's called Mars time, which uh, is basically because the, the day on Mars is about 40 minutes longer than the day here on Earth. Um, so our work hours shift by 40 minutes every day. Um, and so what this means is that sometimes you end up uh, working all night and uh, sleeping all day instead, uh, which sort of messes with your internal clock a little bit. Um, but it's super exciting and uh, you're doing it with a, a big team of people so you're all uh, in it together. Um, and primarily my, my work on these missions involves uh, using data collected by these spacecraft uh, to understand how wind is moving sand and dust around on the surface. And so this is super important for our understanding of Mars, uh, both its geology and climate, um, and how its geology and climate have changed over billions of years. Um, so understanding the history of the planet, um, this data is really important for, uh, but it's also really important for planning future robotic missions um, and even future human missions to the surface. Um, and so this is something I'm super interested in and, and understanding the environment on the surface what the wind is doing, how dust is being transported. Uh, these are all really important things for keeping instruments safe and, and for keeping uh, future astronauts on the surface safe as well. Um, so with that, I think we have a, a little poll question. Um, what do you all think you need, uh, think humans need to live uh, on the surface of Mars? Excellent. You can think about what, what you need here on Earth on a daily basis to survive. You can also look at this image. It might give you a couple of clues of different things to think about. We got a lot of fans of oxygen. That is uh, important. Good. Although we, we got fans of all of these. Yeah, water is growing, food is growing, shelter, Wi Fi is growing. <laughs> these, yeah. Okay, oxygen's definitely winning, though. Oxygen is an important. Sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is so great. We got tons of votes. So we're going to close the poll in three, two, one. Boom. All right. So yeah, so we've got so we listed out all of these things. So are are these things that humans need to live on Mars? Yes, um, all of these things are really important. And so I'm glad they all had some votes. You're all correct. Um, oxygen clearly was, was a favorite and that's uh, an important one. We need it to breathe obviously, um, but all of those are really important just to uh, maintain and, and survive on the surface and even to communicate back to earth. Uh, we do need some sort of communication. So Wi-Fi kind of gets at that shelter for, for protection um, and heat. Those are all things that we'll, uh, we'll dive into a little bit more later, but it's all uh, really important and, and uh, is going into kind of our planning of human uh, missions to Mars in the future. Yeah, and we're apparently getting a whole lot of questions about if humans can visit Mars. Well, that's a question that we will dive into in just a little bit. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this a lot of this is about how how we do that. So love that so many of you are interested in that. That's great. Thank you, Mariah. Yeah, yeah thank you so much, Mariah, Mache, and Carrie. We are going to allow each one of our scientists to talk a little bit more about their research in more um, detail, but we are getting so many questions. We just want to mention that they are all excellent and all of our scientists are going to address a lot of those questions in a moment when they talk about their science. Um, and I just want to um, ask one of them for each one of our scientists. Um, and before we do those deep dives, and this one comes from Abigail, and she wants to know, what does it take to become someone who can study Mars? What an excellent question, Abigail. Thank you so much for that. All right. Do you want any of us to go or? Yeah, please. Jump in. Start. So that's a really good question. And I would say that um, I know Michelle, they, they've said that they did geology as well. So we are all, we are all scientists. So we all went to college and did STEM oriented 
majors in college. I didn't know I wanted to be a geologist until I took a geology and an astronomy class in college. So, and then after that, I went to, I did an internship. So that's kind of like a summer job that you do when in your field of the, the thing that you want to study. Um, and then I went to graduate school, all, all for planetary geology. Yeah, and I'll um, just add to that the, uh, the the group of people that that work on on these missions and that study Mars really study a wide range of things. There's no kind of one thing, uh, as Carrie said. We all uh, do geology more, but there are astrobiologists, there are atmospheric scientists, um, there are chemists. There's lots of different kinds of science done on these missions. So I think that uh, for me, it, it really is. I would recommend finding what's interesting to you um, and really pursuing that. And, and if you can find someone who uh, does something that you're interested in, reach out to them, ask them how they got involved in that um, and find out more about, about what they do and then really just kind of dive into that. And one other thing I wanna to add to that um, is that, well, I, wanted to, I started off wanting to be an astronomer because I didn't have that much of an idea of what, what's going on in space, but I, I ended up, you know, with studying planetary science, planetary geology, and also some astrobiology. So go with the flow. You don't know where it's going to take you, but I promise you it's going to be somewhere fun as long as you do what you love to do. Follow your curiosity. It will lead you good places. Uh, that is fabulous. Thank you all so much for sharing those encouraging anecdotes and advice. Um, so we um, <laughs> we uh, we just got a question that's asking, is it good to have many questions? Yes, it yes. is very good. They say I have tons and tons of questions in my head every second. Yes, that science is, is questions all day, every day. And if you continue to study science, you'll have the tools to be able to find the answers to the questions you have. And so exactly. Let's start now learning a little bit more of the research and science and questions that Carrie asks um, in her research on meteorites at the National Museum of Natural History. Okay, so it's been a little bit since we talked about these, but remember, I'm the one who studies rocks and meteorites, so rocks from space, which we, and we had the poll before where, where we asked you where you thought those come from, and, and a lot of those were were good choices, but the most um, 90, if you had a thousand meteorites, it'd be 999 of them would come from the asteroid belt. And there might be a half that comes from the moon and a half that comes from Mars. So that's how few meteorites we have that come from, from Mars, but most of them come from the asteroid belt. But again, can we go to the next slide, please? And we can see our friends voted oh, yeah. on that poll earlier and everyone voted for asteroids, comets, stars, and other planets. And um, everything there is pretty much correct except for stars, right? Yeah. All the rocky bodies can send us meteorites. Okay. So if you look at the next slide here, these are all meteorites. And some of these were on the slide that I showed you at the beginning when I was showing you the rocks. These are all meteorites and they're all different. But one of these is a special one, the one that's zooming in at you right now. And this one is from Mars, since we're talking about Mars today. You can see this kind of looks like the rest of them. It's got this crust on the outside from when it came through the Earth's atmosphere and it's got kind of a gray color inside and it looks kind of all together not that exciting, but it turns out that this is a really exciting rock and it's a really important one. This is the first meteorite that we actually recognized as being from Mars. And you might ask, how do you even know that these are from Mars? So if we can look at the next slide, this is a picture of that same rock that we used a special rock saw. So who knew there even was such a thing, right? But there are special saws for splicing rocks open. And this is that rock sliced open. You can see that flat face of it. And you can see those sort of stripes where the saw marks were. But there's a really important feature in this rock and there's this sort of dark patch and inside that dark patch, which is a melt pocket, a piece of the rock that actually melted when something hit Mars or impacted into Mars. And we found some special things that helped us figure out that this is from Mars. And so I think we have a poll that is asking, um, what do you think was inside this, this melt pocket that helped us figure out that this was from Mars? All right, so this is a, 
a meteorite and meteorites are different from um, asteroids. We have a couple questions about this because those are the rocks that actually come to earth and they're no longer in space. Just like if a meteorite came from another planet, it came as a meteorite, but it's no longer that actual whole planetary body. All right. they, get, they get knocked off of those other planets or other asteroids by impact, by, by things crashing into them so hard that they actually launch rocks off of the surface. And so we're asking you, what is trapped inside this circled area, this little pocket that helps us match it to Mars? And we are going to share those results in about three, two, one. So Carrie, the highest vote received is melted rock. So thinking about that puzzle analogy that you used earlier, using the minerals to understand more about a rock, but also receiving a lot of votes was gas and um, a less percentage of votes for water and fungus. Right, so I, I told you this is a melt pocket. So yep, there's melted rock in there. But the most important for determining that this was from Mars is actually the gas. So when, when the melted rock formed, it actually cooled really quickly. And when it cooled, it trapped part of the Martian atmosphere in it. And so scientists were able to actually pull those gases out and measure their compositions. And this is, this is just to show you. So we have been talking about Perseverance, the lander or the rover that's on Mars now, but it turns out we've actually been sending spacecraft to Mars for a lot longer than just the last, I don't know, couple of years since we had things like um, Spirit and Opportunity and Curiosity. In the 1970s, the Viking landers, and they didn't drive around, they just landed on Mars, but they had a lot of really cool experiments on them, trying to understand Mars, what it was like. They had a lot of cameras, um, but one of the experiments that they had was an um, instrument that measured the composition of the Martian atmosphere. So what was the atmosphere of Mars made of? So they measured that and they had that composition. And it turns out then when people were, the scientists were getting the gases out of this meteorite, out of the melted rock in this meteorite, they were able to figure out the composition of that gas too. And they put it on a graph that you can see here on the right. And Mars atmosphere is on the left-hand side and it says shergatite glass on the bottom. Shergatite is the kind of Martian rock it is. But those different types of gas all match on that line. They all, so you have, the same amount of each one in the atmosphere that you do in the rock gas. You see that orange line, they line up on that line and that's basically a fingerprint of the Martian atmosphere. So that told us since those all lined up on the same line that these, that these rocks actually come from Mars, which that, is really cool. That is so cool. So even though that lander was on Mars, it was sending information about what that gas in the atmosphere was like. And that was a match to the gas that was, that was found inside that meteorite pocket. Exactly. Yep. And so did that allow you to identify other meteorites in your collection to be Martian meteorites? It did. And if we go to the next slide, you can see, I think all six of these are different types of rocks from Mars. They all came to Earth as meteorites um, and they're all um, pretty much all igneous rocks. So if you've learned about rock types, igneous rocks are things that that solidified from being um, molten. And except for the one on the bottom right is it's actually a regolith breccia, which is similar to the moon rocks that were brought back. That's just a rock that was from the surface, but it's got a lot of the igneous rocks in it as well. And so when we look at the rest of these, we're actually looking at oxygen signatures in them to match it to that original rock that we determined was from Mars. It's a much easier way to do it. But we have now hundreds of meteorites from Mars that, that we can study to try and understand the conditions that may have formed the minerals to help us put together our puzzle to see maybe if some of those conditions were great for supporting life. Okay, so if we go to the next one, you're probably saying, how do you study these rocks? What do you do with them? Well, here we are in our labs at the Natural History Museum. We actually, the first thing that we usually do is make a super, super thin slice of the meteorite and put it on a piece of glass, a microscope slide. If you can see that in the bottom left is a picture of one of these. And that rock is sliced so thin that it's about the thickness of one of your pieces of hair on your head. So super, super thin and light, you can see light passes right through it. And we put that in all kinds of different instruments. This one is called an electron microprobe. And we put that in and 
we zap the minerals with electrons. And from that, we can figure out what those minerals are made of. If we go to the next slide, you can see this is what it looks like in the, in, in the instrument that we see. This is kind of zoomed way back out on that rock, but that you can see the circular thin section, we call it the slice of rock. And if you look, all those little gray and white things are different minerals and that helps us. We can zoom in on those and we can choose which mineral to zap to figure out what composition it is. And each of those minerals is a different composition. And the circled part is similar to that melted rock patch that we saw in the, the very first sliced open Martian meteorite, the melted rock. So you can see it looks different. It doesn't have any of this white mineral in it, but that's sort of how we can tell that that's a melted rock. It's got its own unique textures. So those are the ones that we zap and then we can look at them in other ways. If we look at the next slide, we can actually use a petrographic microscope, which is similar to a microscope you might have in your school, except it's got a few extra sort of gizmos and fancy things on it that help us do take images like this. And this is another slice of a Martian meteorite. And we've used polarized light to look at these minerals. And these minerals actually show up in these beautiful colors like stained glass almost. And you have polarized light in your sunglasses, for example, that helps keep your eyes protected from the light that comes in from the sun. And these, and sometimes when you look at through your sunglasses, the colors look funky, right? But this is helping us, these colors and the shapes of these minerals can help us figure out what kind of rock this, are, this is and what kind, um, what type of environment it came from. And can that help you better understand an environment that may have supported life in the past? It can, yep. So this one, we've looked at enough of these now that we can pretty much say this particular rock, right, originally formed in a lava flow. So we would then look at the rocks that maybe the minerals in there that came later. So if we look at the next slide, We had a special rock from Mars. This is another Martian meteorite. And this one is, it's kind of famous, um, but it probably all happened before all of you were born. Maybe maybe when your parents were younger, they might remember this. This rock came, we, we found it in Antarctica and it actually is the kind of meteorite, it's, it's, it's kind of its own kind of meteorite. We only really have one of these of this rock type. But if you look at the next slide, it had, you can see another piece of the inside of it which is, is broken open. If we can look at the next one, you can see a piece of the inside of it. It kind of looks like the rest, really. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that it stood out from the rest if you just looked at this. But again, we looked at the minerals in here through a microscope and we didn't use polarized light this time. These minerals are actually this color, these orange and black and white minerals you can see. And the sort of clear white things that you see surrounding them are the original minerals that you find, but these are carbonate minerals. And carbonate minerals are really cool. These, these actually grew kind of like a tree ring from the inside out. So from sort of the inside of this mineral, the conditions were the same because the mineral as it grew was all the same. So orange, 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 orange. And then suddenly you reach this black rim, which means that the conditions, the environment that this mineral was forming in changed suddenly. And then it changed again and we grew some white carbonate and then it changed again in another layer of black and you can see all of these carbonate minerals in here have have this same feature of orange in the middle and then a black white black rim and that means that the conditions that it formed under were changing do you have a question maggie yeah i was just going to mention a lot of our friends may not know what a carbonate is but a carbonate is the same mineral that is in um, the coral reef skeletons stony coral skeletons and even snail shells is that right yep yep and and that leads us to our next question what do you think that carbonates need to form these are a really cool mineral that help us understand the environments on Mars. And they're a really important one that we've already talked about. So what do you think that they need that could help us understand the environments on Mars? Okay, so we have so many votes coming in. We're looking at these carbonate minerals, which were found inside a Martian meteorite. And um, we're thinking about what they may need to form. And our votes are coming in very quickly. Um, the highest being carbon, taking a hint <laughs> from that word carbonate. Right, not surprising. There's something else there that it needs. And we will um, share those results in five, four, 
three, two, one. All right. So carbon is the top answer. Well done, everybody. But <laughs> also receiving a lot of votes um, were gas and water, and to a lesser extent, animals and collision or impact like you were talking about before. So what is it? So the most important thing for us right now is water, right? And, and think about, we just talked to you about some other ways that carbonates form. They, they were all water, like, like you said, um, a coral reef that's in the water. So water is really important. Everything we know on, on earth needs water to live. And so as far as we know, things on, that we would look at on Mars would need all water also. And we realized, so this rock is really famous. I told you it was really famous. And that's because they thought that they'd found uh, signs of life, like fossilized bacteria in it back in the 1990s. And that turned out to be not correct. It turned out to be something else, but it was so famous that they actually made a little stuffed animal out of that the thing that they thought they'd found in there. Um, but really important message from that is that you can be wrong in science, but still learn tons and tons because as part of that study, they found these carbonates that we know need water to form. And that means to us that there was liquid water on Mars at some point, which is really, really important, especially if we're looking for any kind of conditions of life that might've been then favorable for life to have formed. So if we look at the next one, there are actually other minerals on Mars that, re that we have found from the rovers that have been up there. So these were found by the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. They call these blueberries, but they're actually the mineral hematite, but it needs liquid water to form also. And they're not really blue. They just sort of look blue in the, in the, the way that the, the rovers looked at them. And they're about a couple of millimeters across these little blueberries, but they're an important sign that there was liquid water on Mars at one point. And so all of these minerals that we've been looking at have shown us that the environment on Mars at some point had liquid water. So maybe that was favorable for life. And maybe it wasn't the cold, dry planet that we see now. Maybe it was something like the one on the top here where you have, you know, oceans. Or maybe, you know, in the poll we said impact was an option. Maybe it's been frozen water all the time and impacts were the, the way that the water was melted and you ended up with flooding or you ended up with um, big rivers being formed that gouged big canyons. So if you look at the next slide, this is Jezero Crater where the Perseverance rover is landed. And I'm really excited because the person, the, this mission is going to gather rocks that it's going to, that a different mission later on, maybe 10 years is gonna bring those rocks back to earth. And we're gonna be able to compare them with our meteorites and double, triple check that our meteorites actually do come from Mars. And it's gonna help us look for signs of life. And it's going to help us understand all the different things that happened in this area. Carrie, thank you so much. It's so cool to learn about how you can learn about Mars and the environment on Mars using meteorites and data and information from Mars landers. So we are actually going to move on to our next two scientists so that they can share their research. Um, we have, um, right now, I think we have about 2,000 questions that have come into our program. So thank you all for all of your questions. We have a team who is um, answering and doing such an amazing work. About 500 of them have been answered. So if you have a question, make sure to check your My Questions tab to see if that question was answered. And listen, Listen carefully to our presentations from our scientists who are probably going to answer some of the questions right now about the um, about the color of Mars and, and sending humans to Mars. So let's transition to our special scientist from the Air and Space Museum. Take it away, Shauna. Exactly. So I'm going to bring Mache on. So Carrie was just talking about carbonates and minerals and figuring out what's going on. And uh, Mache, you were mapping of minerals with light is part of how we do that. So take it away. Absolutely. So Kari mentioned um, carbonates um, that were found in meteorites. And it's very interesting because carbonates are a really cool topic for a lot of planetary scientists because they can be made through life. Um, one other way that they can be made is not through life. So through life, it would be called biotic. But if it was not made through life, it's called abiotic, a meaning not. So how would you make a carbonate on Mars? Well, for the abiotic way, you need CO2, which is carbon dioxide, 
and H2O, which is good, tasty water. So <laughs> back in <laughs> back when Mars used to have a lot of water, this wasn't really a problem. We have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and that CO2 can combine with that H2O on the surface and create carbonates. Of course, there's a lot of other um, technical things that's happening in between, but at the basic level, that's what we're seeing for carbonates. And so with these carbonates, um, this can help us identify both if there's life and also if there was once water, um, especially in particular parts of Mars. But how do we find these carbonates on Mars? That's when we start talking about light. Yay. Yes. So how do we find carbonates on Mars? We use light. And what type of light do we use? We use the sun's light. So the sun's light normally helps us with seeing and also telling us what time it is. But scientists also can use light um, to see things that we can't see. Kind of like how Kari was using her, her electron microprobe to see um, the different types of, or, or to zap the rocks to learn more about them. We're also using the sun's light to zap the surface and we're gonna use a satellite to see what happens once it's zapped to see if we can identify rocks. Very cool. It's nice of the sun to zap it for us. I know, right? Giving us sunlight, heat, and zapping. Right? <laughs> so my next, my, my poll question for you guys is what is light? So what do you yeah. guys think light is? And this is always an interesting question when it's something like light that we experience, we're familiar with, but when you try to define it, it's just sort of, it, it's hard to pin down. So we've got a number of options here. A lot of folks saying energy, a few saying waves and particles, and a few folks saying information, but energy is definitely seeming to be the big winner here. So we will, um, yeah, so I'll, uh, we'll close up that poll and let you keep telling us how, uh, how you use that light. Absolutely. So again, everyone wins because technically they're all the above. But for my, for, for, for what I do, I like to say, see light as energy because this energy is what the molecules in the rocks love to, um, to interact with. So let's talk more about light. So the sun makes many different types of light. It's not just what we see, right? And what we see is normally called the visible light, the visible spectrum, which is basically the colors of the rainbow. You ever wonder how you're able to see the apple is red? Well, that's because of the visible light. And of course, whenever we look at things in the visible light, we can distinguish different things between apples and chairs and, and houses. But when it comes to two rocks, especially if they have the same color like these that I have, it's kind of hard to see if, you know, if one rock is, you know, different than the other. They both look the same, right? Okay. So you can also think of your eyes as a satellite too. Because whenever we're studying Mar whenever we're studying rocks on Mars from space, we're taking that light that's reflected off the surface and it's hitting the satellite, right? Which I'll go into in a second. But from our eyes, our satellite eyes, we can only see that these are white rocks that's when you'll have to use light that you can't see to determine what type of rocks we're looking at. So if we look at the image in the far right, you can see that this rock, and I'm not sure if you can see how the rock is white or anything, but if you look, if, well, once we shine this UV light on these rocks, you can see that the rock goes from white with a little bit of black spot blotches to a red rock with green splotches. That's because the molecules are interacting or dancing to the energy that it's receiving. So if you shine ultraviolet light on a rock, it looks like a weird colorful space rock. I love it. Exactly. Very cool. So how does this all happen? So we have our sun giving off all this energy, 100% of it too. And it's going to hit the surface. It's gonna hit a lot of things, but we primarily care about the one that's hitting the surface of Mars. Once that light hits the surface, we wanna look at the microscopic scale. We wanna see these molecules that make up these rocks. Once these rocks receive that energy, they're gonna basically have a dance party. And why is that? Remember, light is energy. And so these, these molecules are basically filling all of this energy and they're gonna to start to bend and stretch and dance and move and just have a good time. And that's actually really good because different molecules have different dance styles. And we can actually see that from our satellite. So, 
but another thing that we have to think about is that not all the, mo the, mineral, the molecules aren't going to absorb all of the light. And that's okay, because you don't dance to every song that you hear, right? So that light's going to reflect back. And that's where our satellite comes into play. Our satellite's going to take that information that's reflected back and not absorbed. And it's going to create this thing that we see on the right called a spectrograph. Spectra means light. Graph is like to write. So this is a graph of light. And we see these lines that are like dipping down and dipping up like a roller coaster. The ones that are dipping down, that's where those molecules are absorbing all that energy. And the ones that are not dipping, and that's the ones that's reflected back. This is important because this is basically like a fingerprint for different minerals. And that's how we're able to determine what minerals are different. You notice how there are three green minerals here? These three green minerals, these three three green minerals all look the same if you just looked at them. But if you look at the spectrograph, you can see, oh, wow, they're actually different. This is so cool. And I love that you and Carrie kind of study rocks in different ways, but you, 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 you're you using this sort of roller coaster of light to find that dip where the molecules have their dance party, and that tells you what it's made of. That's exactly. awesome. Exactly. It's, it's really amazing how we're able to use this information and also take this information to create something that we can't see so we can see it with our own eyes, which is actually going to lead us to our next slide. So this is the fun part. This is the part that I like because I get to look at the pretty colors. So if we look on the left, we see this normal image of Mars and it looks a little gray and a little bluish um, gray, but that's okay because this is actually a true color of Mars. Uh, sometimes Mars isn't always red, red, red. If you get closer to the surface, it looks a little bit more grayish, and that's okay. So we're going to take this information from our spectrograph, because the spectrograph had these little dips, the roller coasters or the absorptions that we detected. Those fingerprints are will help us identify different minerals. Now, sometimes minerals dance the same beat, and we can take that absorption and put these in a red, green, blue combination. And of course, if you remember from, you know, um, kindergarten, what happens when you mix different colors, right? You get yellow, we get blue, we get purple. And sometimes when you get all the colors, you get white. We can take this information and create this really cool color-coded map that tells us where these minerals are in our image. And not only can we find one mineral, we can actually find more than one. In fact, if you look at this image, this image definitely has about seven or eight minerals because this is actually an image that I use for my research. So you take all, so you get the dance party from the minerals, you figure out a color for each one, mm -hmm. you put the colors over your map like this, and it tells you where the minerals are. So this, so we're getting a bunch of questions about um, how, so how does that help you look for life on Mars? Oh, that's a good question. And so, I think it relates to what you have next too. I believe so. So this oh, is the cool, cool part. So what I like to do normally, I would just stop at just creating the color-coded map and then also maybe even doing a little bit more sprucing up with the data. But what I can also do is take that map and create a 3D image of a crater that I'm looking at. I primarily look at craters because I really do like craters and they tell us a whole lot about the past of Mars, especially whenever you look at the different layers. So when you look at a crater on Mars, sometimes these craters used to be lakes. And, they're, and we call those paleo lakes because paleo means old. So they're really, really old lakes. If we look at these minerals, especially if you overlay them on something that's three-dimensional like this crater, we can actually see where these minerals are um, compared to the geology of this, of this crater. This can tell us a lot of things. One, we know that water tends to stay at the lowest spot, right? If we see any minerals that are related to water, um, in the lowest part of the crater, especially if we know this crater has had history or if we see signs of it used to having water, then this can say, this can tell us a lot about, um, this can tell us a lot about how this mineral formed and if this mineral possibly could have formed biotically or abiotically, if I'm saying right. the word right. <laughs> so cool. Well, and, and you're talking about craters as places where there's water, where we might find those carbonates. So Perseverance just landed in a crater. So can you show us kind of what's going on with that because I know we have um I know yeah we, we landed perseverance in a crater for a reason and we sent it to go look for life so can we let's take a look at that absolutely of course this actually kind of segues us into our next poll question too 
Yeah. Yeah. Which is about um, Jezero Crater. Yes. Hmm. So where is the poll question? Oh, there it is. Wait, no, that's not it, is it? Well, so the question, oh, here we go. Yeah. So is um, in the part of Mars, uh, Jezero Crater, um, which we should be able to show in a second. I'm still seeing the cool 3D rotating, but that might be my internet being <laughs> slow. Um, but yeah, for, for Jezero Crater, yeah, it's what, what was happening in that part of Mars. Okay, then I guess we'll just talk about it without seeing the image. That's okay. Yep. So with Jezero Crater, um, we see these really cool landforms that we kind of see, if, if you're very familiar with um, landforms on Earth, so let's say you live in some place like Louisiana, because I kind of grew up in Louisiana, and this is something I can relate to more closely, but if you know where the Mississippi River ends, right, um, then you would be very familiar with how deltas work. So what do rivers do? So rivers carry sediments and deposit, the, um, deposits um, with them um, all the way till they reach this open piece of land and when, or open area. So when they reach that open area, they're gonna take all the rocks and dirt that they picked up along the way. And so with that area, you also have a location where, they're, where it's teeming with life. Mm -hmm. And so life, you know, of course, they leave behind evidence that they were there. Um, so another thing that you can also think about is if you ever go to a beach, and this may not happen in all beaches, but you may see these white pillars or white walls somewhere, a place where there's a lot of geology. And those are primarily limestone, right? And those are, those are mostly made from shells or life forms um and that's how those carbonates are made but with the but with Jezero crater especially for that particular region we have all these deposits here and over time everything is laid on top of each other kind of like laundry you know that the older laundry <laughs> is going to be at the bottom of the pile while the younger laundry is going to be on top of the pile so exactly. it's really good that um perseverance is going to Jezero crater because we can actually look in that region and from already using satellite imagery and our light we've been able to find carbonates in Jezero crater as well this is good because this is a good sign that there could that this could be a biotic, uh, not abiotic, but biotic way of forming carbonates. So this is why Desiree is really exciting. That's the perfect place to look. I see a lot of people said meteorite impact, which is right. Jezero is a crater. Mm -hmm. um, but several of you also said river flowing. And for everything Mache just said, the, the water would have been bringing sediments. Signs of life would have gotten trapped in there if they were there. Mm -hmm. So Perseverance is there to look and see if anything got trapped in that river delta. One other thing, and I know we can't see the image right now, um, which is, you know, I really want to show this really cool feature that's on the delta is that Yes, Jezero crater is a crater that's created by an impactor, but there's even there's a smaller crater inside Jezero crater that's actually where the deposits are. And I think it's really cute that it's just there. I love it. Craters on craters. Michelle, awesome. there's so many pictures coming back from Mars right now and circulating that I think you gave us some great tools to look at the surface images of Mars with um, some new tools. Thank you so much for showing us how you study um, these special rocks and look for those rocks that may have, um, have been formed biotically by life. And so I want to acknowledge um, right now that it is two o'clock. We are really far behind because we are so excited about Mars. Um, and so I want to um, still invite our final scientists on, but we understand if you can't stay. We have so many questions about Mars's atmosphere being red. Is the sky red? Um, how can humans survive life on Mars? So Mariah is going to be talking a little bit about how her work informs those questions. But um, we do know that some people have to go at two o'clock. We're going to launch a final um, poll right now that helps us take a survey about how much you enjoyed this program. But also when you leave Zoom today, there will be a survey that will pop up on your screen and we'd appreciate any feedback you can provide um, by filling out that five minute survey for us. Um, and now without further ado, I will pass the baton over to Mariah so she can tell us about her work. Yes. And thank you, Michelle. Yes, thank you, Michelle. And actually one more, I'm sorry, one more brief 
update is that we are still answering questions in that Q&A space. So if you feel like your question hasn't been answered, we have answered over 600 in that space right now. So keep checking that um, questions tab to find um, some scientist responses to your questions. Go ahead, Mariah. Go, Mariah. Excellent. Yes, so um, Michelle and Carrie gave us some great information about, uh, about Mars and about potentially searching for ancient signs of life on Mars. Uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach in thinking about the habitability of Mars. And this is gonna be looking at whether humans can exist on the surface of Mars. So we're putting back up this, this image that we had before. Um, and we can point out a couple things here that, um, that we discussed about uh, needing on, on the Martian surface that, we, that you guys answered in that poll before. We can see that these astronauts have uh, spacesuits and oxygen tanks so they can breathe. Uh, we see that they've built themselves a, a shelter, a habitat uh, that looks uh, pretty different inside than it does on the outside. Um, and so what are all of these things trying to tell us? What, why do we need all of these things to survive on the surface? Well, we need them because the environment on Mars is very different than the environment that we're used to here on Earth. Um, and so in order to be able to uh, survive on the surface um, and, and to do work and to live there on the surface, we need to understand these differences and, um, and, and study the environment there so that we can design um, equipment and instruments that can uh, exist uh, and operate on the surface and keep astronauts safe. Um, so I think if you go to the next slide, yep, so we have a different, a different environment and we need to study this, study the environment here. And so uh, what do you all think uh, if we're looking to send humans there in the future? Uh, and I think this is our next poll question. Yes, what do you think we can and should study uh, about the environment on Mars? Right, because if you think about the environment here on Earth, what we live in, you think about what's around you, what do you need? What, what is there that maybe makes it harder? <laughs> to, exactly, and like when survive. you wake up in the morning, what information do you need to plan your daily activities and to decide what you're gonna wear that day? All of that's important. So thinking right. about that, what do you think would be important? Exactly. I definitely check the weather before I get dressed every day. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of votes for temperature, atmosphere, solar radius. This is almost evenly split. We got a lot of interest in uh, in all of these different elements of the environment. This is great. Yeah. All right. We will close this one in three, two, one. And I think temperature is our big winner, but atmosphere and radiation and water are not far behind. Yeah, there's a pretty even even spread there. And I, I will agree that all of those things are, are important things to study and are things that we do study. Um, so how do we actually study these things on a planet that's hundreds of millions of miles away? <sighs> right. So what we do is uh, we send spacecraft to the surface. And so this is where um, my research comes in. Um, and in particular, we send uh, robots that have specific instruments that we can use to uh, measure the, the environment and to, and to study the environment. So this example is um, the weather sensor that we sent on the Perseverance rover. Um, and this is very similar to a, uh, the weather sensors that we sent on, on the Curiosity rover um, and on the InSight lander as well. Um, and so what this weather sensor does is it can uh, measure things like the temperature, and like wind speed and direction. I think there should be another little video there that you can see this sensor um, on the rover itself, um, which is kind of cool. It's, it's sort of small and on the mast. And so yeah, there it is. And so we've sent this before and um, Perseverance is going to continue to make me uh, take measurements of, of uh, the surface environment and, um, and, and send back that information to us so we can understand what the, what the environment there is, is on Mars. And so another thing we do is we send cameras. Um, and so cameras obviously um, uh, often send back very beautiful pictures and, and videos that we like to look at, uh, but they also provide really important scientific information. Um, so this is one uh, uh, little movie that was taken by the Spirit Rover. 
um, and it shows a dust devil traveling across the surface. And so uh, this is cool to look at, uh, but is also really important scientifically. And so we're able to study dust activity and, um, and, and use cameras also to study the wind. Um, and particularly uh, in cases where we don't have weather sensors, cameras can be particularly useful. So I'll tell uh, a short little story here, the, the uh, weather sensor that we sent on the Curiosity rover, which I mentioned uh, looked like that one on the previous slide. Um, it actually uh, broke because of being hit by sand that was blowing in the wind. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So, and you can't send another one or fix it because it's uh, it's 300 million miles away. So what we had to do was uh, figure out a way to use our cameras instead to understand the wind speed and the wind direction. And so I'll show a, an example of this in, in just a little bit. So if we move on to the next slide, yeah, so perfect. This brings up, I think, our next our next poll question. So as I mentioned, we uh, are interested in knowing what the temperature is like on Mars and we send weather sensors to, uh, to determine that. What do you all think the temperature is like on Mars? Do you think it's yeah. colder than Earth? Do you think it's warmer than Earth? Maybe somewhere around the same temperature? Yeah. And this is a question that uh, we get asked by visitors at the Air and Space Museum. You know, people are so interested in Mars. It's this red planet. It's kind of Earth-like and kind of not Earth-like. And so, yeah, figuring out, thinking about, is it hotter or colder or exactly. close? Uh, and every planet has its own, uh, its own temperature and uh, dependent on its atmosphere and how far it is from the sun. Right, right, exactly. I'm not seeing the poll coming up, but you all can be thinking to yourselves, like, do you, you can make your guess, is it, is it warmer or colder uh, than the earth? And then we will, we will do the big reveal. <laughs> oh, there we go. Awesome. All right. Colder appears to be winning, but we've got about a third of folks saying warmer and a few folks saying the same. Awesome. All right. So Raya, what is the what is the temperature like on Mars? Yes, yeah, so um, the the people that voted colder um, got it correct. It's uh, Mars is is a cold place, and so we uh, have sent a number of, of spacecraft there, as Carrie was saying, all the way back to the seventies. We've landed instruments on the surface, and um, the the weather sensors that have been on these spacecraft have helped us determine that Mars is a really cold place. Uh, it's on average about negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So- uh, oh man, Earth that's like being in Antarctica. That's yes, exactly, cool. it's colder, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's really cold, uh, but just like here on Earth, the way that the temperature varies between day and night and uh, between seasons, between uh, winter and summer have very different temperatures, the same thing happens on Mars. So even though it's in general colder, um, there are shifts in the temperature between day and night, uh, very large shifts actually, um, because the thin Martian atmosphere can't really retain much heat. Um, so you can get almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit shift between the daytime and the nighttime. Um, and also during the seasons, there, there are uh, changes in the temperature as well. So sending weather sensors has been uh, really useful for uh, figuring this out. Um, but there are other things that we study too. Uh, one big thing that we study, uh, as I mentioned, is dust activity. So uh, dust storms actually occur on Earth as well. Um, and maybe some people have, have seen these in person. They, they mostly happen in sort of um, uh, desert arid uh, areas. And so uh, I've never seen one in person, but this is a, a, a little anim uh, video of one that exists on Earth. Uh, but on Mars, these storms are um, even more common and much larger sometimes. Um, so they can actually end up being global dust storms that cover the whole planet. Um, so what this is that we're looking at here is uh, these are orbital images taken of, of a global dust storm that occurred back in 2018. Um, so what to pay attention to here, uh, the black areas are, are sort of just um, our, our lack of data. Um, so try not to pay attention to the black. Um, but if you see that there's a small kind of red uh, splotch above the Opportunity rover um, and it grows over time um, to cover, uh, eventually covers where the Opportunity rover is um, and then grows even more um, to cover where, where the Curiosity location uh, is. And so this was a dust storm that we were particularly interested in studying because we had uh, robots there on the surface and understanding um, how these dust storms occur and what the surface environment is like during these dust storms is really, really important. 
And that one got huge. That covered the entire planet, basically. It it covered the entire planet, yes. And it lasted for a couple months, I think. Wow. <laughs> it was big, yeah. So just to kind of uh, highlight why it's important to understand dust activity for, uh, for these missions, um, this is an image of the Opportunity Rover's solar panels. Um, and you can see that over time, uh, it accumulated a lot of dust on them. And so Mars is, is a super dusty place, as, I'm say, as I was saying, and, um, and having dust on your solar panels and on your instruments can affect how they operate on the surface. Uh, for solar panels that are obviously uh, getting their energy from the sun, having a, a layer of dust uh, makes it more difficult to operate and, and decreases your power. Um, so this was really uh, important to understand. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see some uh, observations that were actually taken by the Curiosity rover uh, during this dust storm. So um, uh, as I said, the, the Curiosity rover's weather sensor unfortunately uh, broke. So we had to use images to understand the wind. Um, and what you can see in this image is uh, this is a drill hole that was created by the rover. And so the hole itself is about a quarter size. Um, so pretty small on the surface, um, but you can see that when the dust storm comes, uh, the whole scene gets really red um, and the material around the drill hole gets blown to one direction. Um, and so this helped us understand uh, the strength and the direction of the winds during this dust storm, which are really important for keeping uh, instruments safe. Right. And that would, you know, solar panels matter for a spacecraft, but that's going to matter if you send people because we would be using solar panels for power. So we got to know what the dust storms are going to do. Exactly. And that gets it exactly to this point, which um, was that the Opportunity Rover, unfortunately, and some of you may know this, um, actually ceased operations because of this dust storm. And so these are images that were taken um, during the dust storm. And you can see that uh, the sky gets progressively darker and darker until you can't see the sun anymore. So because Opportunity was reliant on solar panels um, and, and solar energy, it uh, was unable to, uh, to continue operations. And so uh, Carrie actually worked on this mission. So I'm sure this was a, a particularly sad moment for her. Um, but I think it really highlights the importance of of understanding these uh, these weather events. And, uh, and as you said, when we send humans in, in the future, having instruments that, uh, that they're reliant on for survival, it's gonna be even more important to make sure that, that our instruments are safe from, uh, from dust activity and dust storms. Exactly, so the work that you're doing is helping with that, absolutely. Yeah, and so moving forward, um, the Perseverance rover is gonna be continuing to take a lot of the same measurements as previous uh, landers and rovers have trying to understand the environment. Um, but it's also gonna do a couple new really cool things that will hopefully really uh, push us forward towards making human exploration of Mars a reality. Um, so the first one is the MOXIE instrument, which is totally new. We've never done this on Mars before. Um, and what it does is it basically uh, intakes the carbon dioxide Martian atmosphere um, and it tries to turn it into oxygen that can be used for astronauts to breathe on the surface. So this is uh, super innovative, really cool, um, and we're all really excited about seeing whether or not it can uh, produce oxygen that astronauts can actually breathe on the surface. And that gets at that poll we did earlier where it was, what do we need to survive? Oxygen was the winner. So here, for those who are wondering how we're going to make breathable oxygen, this exactly. is one possible way. Yes, this is something that, that uh, scientists and engineers are thinking hard about because it's, it's an important one. <laughs> And they, there's one other um, cool experiment that the, that the rover will run that I wanted to highlight. And um, I think we have a picture of it. Mm -hmm. There it is, perfect. Um, yeah, so we actually sent along with the rover five uh, uh, samples of astronaut spacesuit material. Um, and so what this is gonna help us do is we're gonna uh, study these materials and, and watch how they uh, degrade over time in the harsh Martian uh, environment because of things like dust or solar radiation, um, seeing how well they can uh, maintain their, their um, effectiveness in this environment is really important for, uh, for sending humans there in, in the future. And as we saw in those, in those first, uh, first images, um, uh, astronauts will have to wear spacesuits on the surface. So this is really important for their survival. Um, and we have never done this on Mars either. So it'll be really interesting to see how well these, uh, these materials are able to hold up on Mars. Absolutely. Now, this is so cool. So you've got, you know, you've got cameras on the surface, you've got weather sensors, you've got this MOXIE testing how to turn carbon dioxide into oxygen, you've got suit panels, and all of this is 
understanding the environment, what is it like on the surface of Mars so that we can continue to send spacecraft, we can eventually send humans and, and learn about that planet. This is so awesome, Mariah, thank you. Yeah. yeah so and, cool. and Mariah, we're sorry that we're running so over time. I think maybe you um, should come back to do another presentation as the Perseverance continues to explore Mars and you continue to work on Mars time, exploring all <laughs> of the awesome experiments and questions. Yeah, and the Perseverance will be returning a lot of a lot of great data, so there'll be a lot to discuss. <laughs> Yay, oh, can't so wait. So I want to invite Carrie and Mache back. We are um, we didn't plan on um, going over this far, but we still have almost 700 friends who are watching here with us. So I think it would be excellent for all of you to kind of um, summarize um, about how your work um, complements and builds on each other and how important it is to work on teams um, for our students before we sign off. Yes. You can go first, Mariah, since you just <laughs> You're big on camera. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that I think um, there was sort of a progression in the way that that Carrie, Mache, and I were uh, were discussing things and how we study Mars and um, sending uh, robots was sort of the next evolution of Mars exploration um, and and was taking us the next step further towards uh, towards human exploration and. Um, I love what they do and, and it, it, all of it sort of guides each other. Um, it's sort of a progression from how we uh, originally started studying Mars from afar and then sent spacecraft there to orbit uh, and then eventually to land and to rove and then hopefully humans in, in the future. Um, and I would say, yeah, working on a team, uh, it, it's, it's a great and exciting experience. It can be difficult. There's lots of different personalities, lots of different scientists who wanna study different things. Um, and so there's often uh, discussions, healthy discussions about what are we going to do, what are the priorities, um, and, and even uh, differences in opinion about what certain results mean. Um, but it's really uh, having all of those different opinions working together makes uh, the end result much more uh, significant. And uh, it helps us achieve a lot more when we all work together. Yes. How oh, excellent. Love it. Michelle? about working yeah, on the team. I definitely agree with a lot of, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I definitely agree with a lot of what, Mar what Mariah was saying because the teamwork is what makes the dream work. And I know that like, like she, like what she said, like a lot of these things that we were doing, like they're all like very important stages, you know, getting this information from another planet. Like we're so lucky that we're able to get Martian meteorites from Mars. And even though they may not be from this current time period, but it, there's, it's still important. That's what caused us to want it. Well, it's one of the reasons why we wanted that we decided to do all these extra things to get to Mars. And the mapping component I love so much about, the one thing I love so much about the mapping component is that this helps us pick where to land. We wouldn't have known about Jezero Crater and these sediments or the carbonates without remote sensing, which is what we're, which is what this is called. Um, and it's really important that we're also, you know, relaying this information to the engineers as, as well as other scientists who work in various parts of planetary science, so we can all get to Mars and study the same thing because we are all saying the same thing. We're just speaking in different languages and not languages literally, but languages um, methodology, method, methodologic, methodologically. <laughs> with methods um yeah. so um that's such a great connection <laughs> go ahead carrie okay um i i obviously totally agree with them both about working on teams and and i really like that with what is the, the team can't have the dream without the team that's fantastic yeah. uh, but but really you can't i mean and we have the team of people all over the world who collect meteorites. We have a team of people who classify these meteorites and tell them what, tell us what kind they are. We have a team of people that we give the meteorites out to that do research on them to help us study them. And those are what help us, like Mache was saying, ask these questions that we want to answer by taking the next step to spend, send the satellites and the spacecraft up there. So for me, and it's just also important to remember that this didn't happen, like we haven't always done this, right? Like 50 years ago, they were just sending up something that could just land and they were so happy that both of the landers they put up there worked, right? So, so 
the fact that this now we're at this stage where we've got multiple rovers up there doing and sending things back and lots of people working on them. Science is kind of slow. And, but every time we get more and more and more information, it helps us build the stronger and stronger answers. Science, is, science doesn't happen super quickly and we don't always have the answers. And sometimes we change our answers based on these healthy discussions with other members of our teams. And so just because we think something now, you know, maybe we won't think that once we gather more information as part of this working on a team. So, and for me, it's full circle that the meteorites we have, right? We're gonna be able to compare those to rocks that we bring back from Mars finally in 10 or so years. And hopefully some of those will come to the museum and maybe some of you will be able to study those by then. Maybe you'll be in graduate school or working on a project where you'll get to study some of these rocks. But uh, one thing we can guarantee is that those are gonna open up more questions and we're gonna have to go back and answer them. So, so we won't be ending just because we bring some back. <laughs>